Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to talk about business valuation or in other words, the best way to get the most money out of it when you sell your business. Now to dive deeper into the topic today, Ahmed Kildorf is joining me. He is the co-founder and CEO of the Forger Group, an investment bank focused on the lower middle market e-commerce space. He also founded Pitstop, an app to improve men's life and has a data entrepreneur, has been a data entrepreneur since 2012 and the founder and executive chairman of Eagle Alpha. Prior to his entrepreneurial work, Ahmed was an investment banker at Morgan Stanley and Credit Swiss, so he has a vast background when it comes to valuation. So let's welcome him to the show. Hi, how are you today? Hi, Klaus. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm great. Looking forward to a good discussion. Yeah, great to have you. Let's start right to visit. Um, tell me about or our listeners a bit on how you get involved in the world of e-commerce and investment banking. Sure. Um, it goes way back to 1999. Uh, it was the time of the dot-com boom. And um, having done a degree in business and law, I saw that there was a new master's in e-commerce. I think it was the first type of its kind globally. And I couldn't resist electing to do that course, um, given how the internet and e-commerce was really starting back then. Um, and uh, so I've had one eye on e-commerce for the last 25 years. Um, um, uh, but of course, um, back then there wasn't actually much e-commerce in 1999. So what I decided to do was to join the world of investment banking to do some deals, mainly dot-com deals at the time in the year 2000 before the uh, the dot com uh, bust um, and um, yeah that 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 got me on my journey of investment banking. Okay, so you're right. We're right there from the beginning of e commerce. Basically, twenty five years. There's very few people in the world that can say that they're on e commerce since twenty five years. That's a very long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a few gray hairs to show it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at my white hair. Same story here. So. Obviously, a lot of e-commerce businesses came up and a lot of founders, startups have always the exit in mind when they start their business. And then it's important to basically find a way to make the valuation one of the most critical factors in growing your business. So what is one of the most important things that can affect how much a shopping business or e-commerce business is worth when you want to sell it? Well, obviously, obviously, the profit and loss account, you know, the financials are key. Um, uh, but the, the numbers, you know, the better the numbers um, and the, uh, you know, the, the the more likely, the higher the multiple. Um, but that's sort of quite superficial. Um, my, my, my my stock and trade answer to that question is um, uh, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Um, you know, he is CEOs of... Um, S and P five hundred companies are the you know the leading companies around the world. They they plan their exits one to two years out, maybe even more in some cases. Um, it really frustrates me that a lot of econ entrepreneurs I meet start thinking like one quarter out, or in some cases one month out. Um, that's not that's not how the best the best business folks around the world do you know plan for an exit. So my my first answer is is um, if you want to work towards an exit, start planning as early as possible. Um, because and then if you if you double click on that, why why would you do that? Well, there's lots of things one can do to uh, make the business more viable, uh, not sellable, viable. Um, and the best businesses get bought, not sold. And so, uh, let's think of some examples. Um, there's 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 red flags that you might have to get rid of. Um, I have 25 years experience in M and A. I couldn't operate a brand at all, but I do know how to operate an exit deal. And that includes trying to identify red flags that I picked up over the over the decades to make sure that the business I'm selling doesn't have those red flags. Simple example, um, a few years ago, we were selling a brand and the acquirer uh, sent a team to do due diligence on the manufacturing plant out in China. And the audit of that plant scored 3.3 out of 10, which is the lowest score that they had ever heard of. And there was fire safety issues. There was um, human resource issues. You know, all sorts of things. And um, the deal was the deal was killed. Uh, there was no chance that that acquirer in the states was going to acquire that brand, given that supply chain uh, risk. Um, now that sounds obvious, but but if you're selling your business and you have a, have manufacturing in China or elsewhere, have you done an audit, an independent audit of of how that 
of how that manufacturing facility scores. Most, most, most have not. It's not expensive, but it's just one of these things you want to tick the box and, and, and you know, prepare for. Um, and if, uh, if you, if you rush that and you get, if you get negative response and you, you know, it's, it's hard to suddenly change supplier, uh, because the buyer will want to see a few quarters of smooth supply chain, you know, post change of supplier. So that's one thing once you do one to two years out, make make sure you a you've got a good supplier. If you don't change supplier or have multiple options and then but but show the throughput, show show business working um uh, for a period of time. So there's lots of red red flags, Klaus, that you want to get rid of. There's also just some low hanging fruit. Um so are you um you know, right now the markets are wanting businesses that are more bottom line focused than top line focused. Now, that 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 was very different two years ago, and most likely it'll probably be di- different again in two years. So it's fluid. So uh, and that's sort of not helpful, is it, to your listeners? But uh, it's sort of you need to work with an advisor that sort of is monitoring the data, so that you're 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 chasing to where the puck's going to be. If you're selling today, it's got to be about bottom line, as in buyers would prefer to see a higher net margin net net margin that than than you know uh, chasing for growth on the top line in two years we'll have forgotten the pains of the last few years most likely and and buyers will probably want to see more top line growth um than than you know an amazing net margin so so um uh you know that needs to be taken into account to create a plan and when in terms of when when and what you're bringing to market at, at, at the right point in time so there's there's hopefully a few examples happy to Happy to give some more if that's helpful. Yeah, very interesting that you mentioned it's not about creating a sellable business, but having a buyable business. I think that's a, a huge difference. And a lot of people just have the sell or the sale in mind and not the buyer in mind, what they are looking for. Now, you said before that you need to plan ahead of time, a year or so, or even more when you're trying to sell your business. Now you said always the markets are changing and e-commerce business, e-commerce markets are changing very, very fast. What's it in the current situation? And there's a lot of things coming in. Inflation is coming in. Recession is coming in. Um, bigger players are coming in. Shifts in e-commerce behavior are coming in. What kind of trends do you see? What business will become a, uh, basically a target for, for bigger businesses to buy them. Um, well, I think right now, if you look at the data um, within the different categories of e-commerce, um, the, the categories that are growing um, from a revenue perspective and, and putting through price increases successfully are categories like beauty, pets, and baby. Um so it's no surprise, therefore, then right now the acquirers that we speak to are more interested in those categories uh, than, say, for example, uh, home and garden. Um, you know, home and garden did incredibly well during the COVID period for obvious reasons. We were stuck at home looking to do basic refurbishments. Um, but now, ever since everyone's allowed out again, people are, are buying more beauty products, for, as, as an example, to, to, to make themselves look 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 at more handsome or prettier uh, when they go out. Um, so again, a, a bit like that comment of the market wanting revenue or bottom line, it's also fluid in terms of uh, which categories are doing better depending on the, 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 the time and the dynamics. And and therefore, um, it, it's impo- ideally you're in a category that's on the upswing and you sell on the up and uh, not when it's, you know, it's starting to decline. Right. Um, and you know, timing is everything in business, isn't it? But it's it it is sometimes hard to time timing, especially if you're not tracking the data. Um, we work with a company called Grips Intelligence, uh, which to me has the best data points as to which categories are doing well or not. Uh, they speak on our quarterly valuation webinar, um, and they have data based on consumer transaction data, hard data, and um, so they they have a finger on the pulse as to which categories are doing well and not well, and that and that goes into our thinking in terms of how aggressive you can be in, in terms of pricing of a deal and and, and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. For our listeners who are not um, used to mergers and acquisitions and business valuation, can you give me an example about the different steps that are involved to going through the whole process? Yeah, we have a seven-step process, uh, Klaus, um, um, that we I used to use at, at 
at Morgan Stanley, a, you know, a very big Wall Street firm. Uh, so we, we're all about bringing Wall Street level of approach down to the small e-commerce world. Um, it's a seven step process. The first step is preparation. Um, so uh, we don't go live with any deal unless we have a simple two page teaser, typically a 50 page SIM, which stands for confidential information memorandum to position the business and the growth story in the best light and three uh, bespoke data room. A data room contains all of the obvious information that a buyer would want to sort of think about whether they want to submit a letter of intent and, and, and uh, uh, based on what terms. Um, that, that, that takes at least a month to pull together those three items. Um, and only then do we start phase two, which is the marketing phase, which is where we, we put the, the deal, initially the teaser, to grab the attention of people at any one of three different types of institutional buyers. Um, they could be corporates or strategics. Private equity firms are the newest category in the last few years is, is aggregators. Aggregators can be both DTC-led or FBA-led. Um, they're new. Before before aggregators came along, it was really the two other categories. It was, is, it was strategics and, and private equity. Um, so there are two of the seven stages. The third stage, just to finish, is um, my favorite stage, which is you know the negotiation. It's when you're getting you're getting people saying I'm interested, um, uh, and they're thinking about submitting their LOIs, letters of intent. Then they do submit the letters of intent, and we help the entrepreneurs prepare them like apples with apples uh, as best as possible, and you play them off against each other to ultimately get the best terms for for our client, the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So I understand the Project Group is an investment bank focusing on lower middle market e-commerce companies. Um, as a partner of the, the company, do you find a buyer or what's the, the, the partnership? How does that look like? Absolutely. That, that's our job. Yeah. So um, we, want, we want the entrepreneur to continue to run the company as best as he or she can do. That's the best thing they can do to help us ultimately get them the best deal. Mm -hmm. uh, we do all the documentation. Um, we uh, put the business in front of all the right buyers. Um, we're incredibly close to buyers of e-commerce brands. Uh, I'll give you three three examples. One, we host the only conference for e-commerce brand acquirers globally. It's in New York every January. Mm -hmm. uh, two, I have a WhatsApp group for C-suites of e-commerce uh, acquirers. 132 members on my mobile phone for my sins and um, um, messaging all the time. Um, and um, number three is uh, one of my co-founders is a, an operational e-commerce guy. Um, so we're not just corporate finance geeks. He ran e-commerce for um, Water Wipes, the largest baby wipe company online. And that's really important because he understands buyers and, and how to articulate the growth story to, to buyers. Yeah, I think it's quite important that from a financial side, from a bank, bankers aside that, that you have a background on how e-commerce actually works. Um, I remember when I did my first startup in 2001, uh, also a long time ago, talking to banks, I literally had no idea what we were doing. Uh, can, you, can you give me some examples of, of companies that you have sold and what kind of um, results they can expect? Yeah, our most recent deal um, was uh, an Amazon house of brands out of the UK. It uh, incubated six brands, got to over $30 million in revenue and sold to uh, a U.S. firm um, in February of, of this year. We, we can't disclose the name of the acquirer um, uh, or, or the specific valuation, but that was an, an Amazon FBA-led brand. The typical range today for those types of businesses is between, for profitable FBA brands, is between 2.5 and 4.5 times SDE seller discretionary earnings. That's where most businesses are trading today, and and we, we that the valuation was just slightly above that the the high end of that range, um because it was a bigger it was it was a it was a family um uh, it was a house of brands as opposed to one one individual brand, and just to sort of complete the picture that those numbers are for FBA led brands for DTC uh, led brands for example Shopify or Big Commerce, um, the multiples are higher because they own the customer. And um, so typically we see trades at the moment between between 3x and 12x EBITDA. Um, so, for example, we sold a business last year called JFlex Fitness for 7.1 times EBITDA. 
Um, and you know, to get to the higher end of those multiples, you need a bigger business. You need to be in one of those categories that we discuss where the, the timing is right. Um, ideally, you've got a big subscription recurring element to revenue. If not repurchase rate, but rec- you know, recurring revenue is is, is game changing from a valuation perspective. Okay, you just mentioned a couple of things that you're looking for. Who's your perfect customer? Um, our perfect customer uh, today is uh, a business ideally doing at least 10 million revenue, where revenue is growing in a category that's in demand, bet baby beauty. Ideally, the subscription revenue are, if not, a high repeat purchase rate. And um, and they're transparent and easy to work with. And, you know, th- th- that's obviously important. Life's too short to work with people that are difficult to work with, to be honest. And um, I've done too many deals where, where you know, and I, I've looked back and said I didn't enjoy working with those people. We're, we're, um, we're looking to work with, you know, fun, interesting people who are looking to help their baby get to the next stage. And, um, that's what we do. We, we can put it to a good home to help it continue to grow. Okay. Talking about localization, um, you're based in, in, in Dublin. Where are your customers coming from? Obviously, our listenership is, is global. What's the country where you're most focusing on? North America. Um, uh, certainly on the entrepreneur side, most of our businesses we've sold are, are, are North American. On the acquirer side, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture, uh, probably mainly North American, but also European. Um, I have three companies, all of which who are North American orientated uh, in nature, but for family reasons, I live in Dublin, Ireland. Okay, excellent. Where do you earn from? What's what's your share on on a deal? Uh, the way we uh, make our money is through um, we get paid by the seller, and and that's that's the way that's the model of investment banks for decades. Uh, it's nothing new there. Uh, the specifics are there's two components, Klaus. We have a commitment fee, an upfront commitment fee, and then a success fee. And we don't get rich on the upfront commitment fee. It's all it's all back end and success fees if we get a deal for the seller. Um, within the success fee, there can be um, a percentage for hitting a basic milestone uh, in terms of valuation, and then there can be increments for hitting higher higher thresholds of valuation to ensure that we're aligned with. Um, reasonable valuations that the uh, that the entrepreneur believes they can obtain. Okay. You mentioned before that you should start planning for a sale long time in advance, but once it comes to decision, how long actually does it take? Uh, uh, typically uh, four to six months. Okay. And that includes you finding a buyer if there's a suitable one or how does that work? Yeah, that, that's, that includes um, the seven steps. Uh, if, if it's an Amazon FBA business, it's generally shorter. They're simpler businesses. If it's um, a DTC led business, it's more like six months. But that's from when we're instructed to start um, that first phase of preparation to actually, you know, getting the check in into the bank account of the of the seller. Um, <laughs> typically, we like to work with uh, clients quite far far out from actually starting that process. We have something called a valuation audit where we do a de- detailed four week dive looking under the hood of the business understanding the business and presenting back to the entrepreneur on the things he or she could do to increase the valuation and in that case if we do that it allows us to work with the client on a one or two year view and um and slowly begin to prepare for the exit which is the right way to do it um we're big believers in this concept uh, of flirt date marry Klaus. you know it's the same in personal relationships and um, yeah, we think it's the same in M and A. It sounds silly, but um, you know, you you if you want to sell, you need to be flirting with the right buyers early. Get on their radar. Make sure they're sort of know you're coming to market. Then start dating, and then start you know find the right marriage. Yeah, um, I think it's 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 important what you mentioned before that you personally like to work with fun companies, interesting companies, and I think there's like three parties to the story. There's the seller, there's the buyer, and you in the middle. And I think it just needs to click to make it a, a good deal at the end of the day. Before we come to the end of the coffee break today, is there anything that you want to share with our listeners that we haven't covered yet? It's a great time to be a buyer. Uh, don't be afraid to think about acquiring a competitor over the next year. Um, if you, if your business is doing well, growing, um, think, think about, uh, increasing shareholder value, getting to scale by, by acquisition. 
and then and then selling the combined entity in one, two, or three years. Um, most people sort of you know think about just what they have today, but actually, you know, uh, think think outside of the box and happy to help people explore that if they're interested. Okay, where can people find more about you guys? Our website, Klaus, is the Group dot com. Um, uh, our inquiries at the Group dot com. Okay, and I think you had it offered for a complimentary call to discuss on how to prepare for an exit. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really interested to talk to brands who are doing you know at least ten million in revenue, and uh, very happy to have a uh, an introductory call to explore. Um, you know, the feasibility of an exit for them in the near term or, or medium term. Okay, cool. I will put the links to your website in the show notes and you're just one click away. Emmett, thanks so much for the chat today. I think it's a very interesting um, topic to have always the exit in mind and um, to do it the right way so that you get the most out of it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Klaus. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, Klaus here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Before we wrap things up, I've got a couple of important points to share. Firstly, if you have enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, here's a simple way to do it. Help me out with that algorithm magic by liking, commenting, and subscribing on your favorite podcast app. And if you're feeling extra generous, leaving a rating would be great. Your support helps me bringing more impactful guests on the show, and it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Secondly, I want to talk about to all your business owners out there. Here's a question. Are you tired of juggling everything in your business while struggling with your marketing tasks? Fed up with hit and miss experiences of hiring freelancers or agencies that don't quite get your vision? But perhaps you're not ready to commit to a full-time in-house marketer just yet. Well, I've got a solution for you. Introducing our fractional marketing team. My team and I provide top-notch experienced marketing professionals to become an extension of your business. Not only will they save you up to 50% on cost compared to traditional hires, but they also take care of all this time-consuming, repetitive and complex marketing tasks that have been holding you back. And this way, you can concentrate on what truly matters, the core of your business. To learn more about how we can help you to scale up your online sales with a fractional team member, head over to our website, smart-ecommerce-marketing.com, or reach out to me directly and I'll get you the details. You will find the links in the show notes. Thanks for being a part of our podcast community and remember your support means the world to me. Until next time, see you then.